this session because at the end of it, uh, in previous years, I felt more optimistic and then that optimism has often been dashed when the, uh, when the actual year has happened. So I'm going to start with that again and I'm going to start with you, Jan. Uh, Jan is one of the foremost analysts and forecasters of the US economy. He's been consistently right, actually. You've been quite, quite downbeat most of the time and you've been consistently uh -huh. right. And so I want to know uh, what's going to happen to the US economy next year because it's become to me, somewhat like waiting for Godot. You wait for the recovery to accelerate, and you wait, and you wait, and it never happens. What's going to happen next year? Uh, I think the economy will accelerate. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, and I think, I, I think next year, I mean, the, the rationale for why the economy should accelerate in 2014 uh, is much stronger than the rationale was, say, a year ago for why the economy might accelerate in 2013. Two th a year ago, we were looking into uh, a large increase in the fiscal drag. Even if you had sort of non-catastrophic uh, expectations about the fiscal cliff, uh, it was pretty clear that there was going to be some restraint. Uh, we would get some tax increases. We would get some spending cuts. And the pace of, uh, of that adjustment would pick up relative to, 2000, uh, relative to 2012. And so I think the, the a forecast of acceleration in 2013 uh, was a tough one to have. Some people did have it. The Fed did have it, uh, but uh, but it wasn't it wasn't a, a, it was an uphill struggle. This year, all you need is that the impulse from from the private sector that we're already seeing in 2013 stays roughly where it is, uh, and the fiscal drag is going to diminish a lot. Okay, let's and I don't want to go too far into numbers, but let's put a few numbers on this. This year, what the economy is going to grow by? You know, somewhere below two percent. Nothing at all uh, impressive. What's going to? What's your expectation for next next year? Annual average close to three. Uh, oh, that's you know, fourth better. quarter to fourth quarter. I think it's going to be a little more than that. Uh, that's so. If you if you look at growth through the year, uh, I think we'll see a three percent. Okay, plus, so that's a significant uh, kind of acceleration. Jacob, you have uh, f watched the U.S. and watched the global economy for many years, um, from the policymaker standpoint. Now, for, from the financial market standpoint, can you stand back a bit and? Explain to us how you see 2014, and do you agree with this view that, Jan's view, that it is going to be a lot better, significantly better than it has thus far? Well, thank you. It's a delight to be here, and I always like to agree with Jan, which I do. I would like to put some color around it. Color. That, that means pessimism? <laughs> the English language has an extraordinary uh, ambiguity to it. <laughs> When you grow at zero and it goes to 0 0.1, you call it accelerate. <laughs> you could have called it improved. You, call, you could have called it stabilize. You could have called it prevent a s further slowdown. So I'm concerned about the word acceleration. I think that the US is indeed going to be better than what uh, it used to be in the near in the past uh, in the near past, but uh, we need also to remember one important thing: many of the reasons for the U.S. slow growth are still with us. Uh, there is no question that the financial sector is stronger than it was before, and in this regard, the crisis that we had uh, had some fruits. But let's face it: there is still a lot of uncertainty. Much of it emanates from Washington, and some of it emanates from abroad. When it comes to Washington, there is still some regulatory uncertainty in spite of the progress that we have in some of the regulation aspect. When it comes to governance, there is still dysfunctional work in Washington. When it comes to uh, the long term, and we will discuss it later, the role of uh, Medicare and the role of uh, the burden on the budget that comes from uh, many of these kind of things, they are still there. When we look abroad, let's face it, you will have Joe Ackerman speaking here later on, and I'm not sure what he will say, but I don't think that Europe is out of the woods. Uh, there is no question that some of the dire predictions of a complete dismantling, etc., are out of the window, but by the same token, some of the structural issues are still there, and we may come back to it. So. When all is said and done, the U.S. is stronger than what it was before. But I was once a forecaster. I've graduated now to become analyzing other forecasts. <laughs> so as a forecaster, there is a tendency that 
you are much more optimistic two years down the road, and when you get there, you are revising your predictions. Look at the IMF forecasts during the past five years, six years, whatever you want. And there is a beautiful column at the end of the table which says our forecast for next year as of a year ago and our forecast for next year as of today. And I don't recall a period in which there was such a uniform downward revision with such a large magnitude as time passed by. And therefore, in, the, in other words, past forecasts have not worked so well. So I put the four quotation marks around future forecasts. And I do say one final remark, which is, yes, the situation better. The word accelerate causes me some nervousness. And uh, there are still things that are out of long-term equilibrium. You cannot tell me that the fiscal house is in long-term equilibrium. You cannot tell me that the monetary house is in long-term equilibrium. We will talk about that separately. There is one important element, which is the energy, which will be a major, major engine in the US growth, which was not before. In the past, we were worried about energy crisis. Now we are talking about energy independence. And those are very important factors. But still, there is a lot of way to go. Well, I would call that a somber coloring that you've added to the view. But I, I, I think you raised a lot of- Somber means realistic. Somber means, re OK, realistic coloring. Uh, to Jan, I think, does not fall into the category of super rosy forecasters, even over the past uh, few years. But what I, I, rather than focus on exactly what the figures are, I think both of you raise what is a very interesting point, which is, is what's going on in the US that we've been in the period of hangover after the financial crisis, and that that period of hangover will at some point come to an end? Is it that policy, and you mentioned the fiscal situation, you mentioned uncertainty from Washington, is it that policy has been part of the reason that the recovery has been so slow? Or is it, and this is a new and fashionable argument that Larry Summers made uh, at, the, at a recent conference at the International Monetary Fund in Washington, where he said, is perhaps the US in secular stagnation? That's the phrase of the moment, where in the, the long-term prospects for investment and for growth are much lower. Where do, you, where do you see the US? I would say it's mainly the, the drags uh, after the, the recovery. And uh, of course, Summers, in his, uh, in his remarks, also referred to Reinhard Rogoff, uh, the, the Reinhard Rogoff factors. Uh, uh, those were the, 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 the excess debt the wave. The deleveraging in the private sector that holds down growth for a long period after an asset and, uh, and credit bubble. Uh, and I think that is reason number one for why uh, growth has been as slow as it has been. Um, and I would add to that the need to unwind excess supply in the housing sector. Uh, that's also been a uh, substantial drag. Uh, and then in addition to that, uh, fiscal policy has been uh, very contractionary, uh, especially in the, in the last year. Um, prior to that, it was a little more mixed. You had some drag from the state and local sector, uh, but it wasn't, uh, wasn't as large. But uh, if you talk about 2013, I mean, the fact that uh, you had a tax increase worth 2% uh, of disposable income at the start of the year, uh, and you had some large-scale spending cuts that took, up, took away about half a percentage point from growth. Uh, I mean, that is very, very important, I think, in, in appreciating uh, what, uh, what 2013 has, has been like, because outside of that, it really hasn't been that bad a year. It's just been uh, uh, primarily uh, really the fiscal drag that's held you back. But that then suggests that underlying the, uh, there isn't a sort of underlying deterioration in the US's prospects, that it is the short-term policy that has dragged the economy down and that maybe therefore things will look rosier. Jacob, you, were, you, would, you, were, you had a more somber interpretation. Do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's a very gradual healing. I mean, secular, you know, secular is, a, is of course a, that's a big word. Uh, uh, and well, that, it's very depressing, that can, right? Can, We're in secular stagnation. It sounds, it, you know. I mean, it is certainly true about. that we have seen uh, a disappointing, disappointing outcomes for the economy for a long period of time. I do think that, you know, the equilibrium real interest rate over the last few years has been negative. If you think of the equilibrium real interest rate as the rate that would be needed to get actual output into line with, uh, with potential output, uh, uh, I, I do think that uh, that has been negative. What, I'm, what I think, though, is that at the margin, at the margin, these things are lifting. Uh, in terms of where the level of output is and where the level of employment is relative to potential, that's not going to make a major difference 
uh, you know, anytime soon. It's not, it's not like a year from now, we're going to, be, we're going to wake up and, and say, you know, all of a sudden we're, we're back to full employment, we're back to uh, the pre-crisis uh, trend, trend for output. I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. But I do think that uh, from the perspective of somebody who looks at this from a somewhat more short-term perspective, you know, the difference between 2% growth and 3% growth, while perhaps not so massive uh, from, from a long-term perspective, is actually pretty meaningful. Uh, and that's, uh, that's what, what I would focus on uh, in what I said. One, Sorry. one part of, Jacob, the, of this discussion, and you mentioned it earlier, is the extraordinary uh, role that monetary policy has played. And we are in you know, uncharted waters in monetary policy terms. We also have a change coming next year uh, at the Federal Reserve. We have Janet Yellen uh, becoming the new chairman. Can you tell me what, two things, since you have been a very successful central banker, do you think broadly what the central bankers are now doing is right? Um, do you think this uh, monetary loosening is the appropriate way to go? Uh, and what do you expect to happen in 2014? I will come back to it in 10 <laughs> seconds, literally 10 seconds, but I just want to make sure that when we leave here that the message or my belief is clear. I am basically very bullish about the US economy, but it's not because of the quality of the policies so much, but because of the fundamental intrinsic strength of strong markets and entrepreneurial spirit and property rights, and the things that create long-term stability for an economy. But we were talking about the very short term. Coming to your question, there is, you said uncharted territory. There is no question. We are in an uncharted territory. If a central banker who was not around for the past five years went to sleep uh, five, six years ago and woke up today and was shown, for example, the balance sheet of the Fed, without being told that it is the balance sheet of the monetary authority, it would be difficult for him to guess that it is. <laughs> and it's a serious remark. It's not a statement that says that it's good or bad. I thought, I think that the Fed has done a very good job. That's not the issue. But there has been a big change. In the old days, look even 2007, you look at the balance sheet of the, of the Fed, most of the assets, were treasuries. The characteristic of treasuries are that they are very liquid, they have the same degree of safety, they are belonging to the same risk class, and that's the instrument the Fed is conducting monetary policy. Fast forward three years from then, 2010, about 60% have been MBS, mortgage-based security. Those are less liquid assets, they represent specific sectors, they are not aggregative assets that can be unloaded from one day to the other, like treasuries. The nature of the balance sheet has changed fundamentally, which makes, therefore, the question of, is this the new paradigm, or was it a detour? When it was introduced, it was viewed as, by the very use of the powerful words, exceptional policies, unconventional implicitly meaning there are non-exceptional policies and there are conventional policies which we still hold to be true. We are now five years after the event and we are still just the very thought of tapering creates, a, you know, a big noise. I think that one of the major challenges for the Fed or for any monetary authority at this stage is to really highlight the fact that we should not throw the textbooks away only because we have made a detour for a while. That it is a detour rather than a new paradigm. And if you say there are some secular things, etc., let's limit it in time. Because it is inconceivable to me that the corpus of economics that has been guiding us for so many years, and successfully so, should be put aside because of very exceptional nature of a crisis which required short-term solutions, but it needs to be clarified to the markets. It is not a new paradigm. So therefore, don't be surprised when an exit takes place. In fact, you should, if you trust the Fed, you should celebrate when the Fed tells you that it is ready to taper, because it means that the Fed judges 
that the detour is about to be over and we are coming back to the good on normal days. And that's a matter of self communication. Can I, can I push you, though, a bit on that? Because another way of looking at history is to say, well, you're right, that for the last 20 years, we've had a paradigm of inflation targeting. It, central banking has become a kind of professionalized world of independent central bankers, technocrats, essentially following the same recipe around the world, uh, successfully bringing inflation down. But that's really the paradigm of the last 20 years. And before that, there were many other fashions in monetary policy. There was, there was monetarism, straight monetarism. There was much less independence of central banks. Is it, one could posit, that central banking goes in waves and that maybe inflation targeting was the way of the last 30, 20, 30 years and that we are, in fact, in a new world now where something else will emerge, whether it's nominal income targeting, whether it's central banks trying to do too much, losing their credibility, but that it's going to be harder to go back to the world before 2007 than perhaps you think. Well, we need to, you can never put a genie back to the bottle, but you should never forget how the bottle looked before the genie came out. So we need to recognize that when central banks adopted inflation targeting, and uh, I'm very pleased that the Bank of Israel was a very early uh, adopter in 91. Uh, the reason was not that we were sitting in the room scratching our head and suddenly saw the light, but rather the challenges were challenges of inflation, challenges of focusing what you do, challenges of accountability, challenges of clarity, and basically you say, this is my target, I'm going to do whatever is needed with the instruments at my possession. Judge me, and we communicate with the markets in this regard. We don't need forward guidance, because the forward guidance is the inflation target objective, and everyone looks exactly where I am relatively to the objective. Those were the good old days. I still think, and if you look at all the changes in central bank legislations that have taken place in the past 25, 30 years, they were all in the direction of two directions. Number one, in the early days, putting price stability as the center. Not because price stability is the most important thing only, but because of the recognition that that's where monetary policy has its comparative advantage. But subsequently, another objective was added, financial stability, which is valid and correct. But the danger would be that central banks will become intoxicated with the success, will assume additional responsibilities without getting new policy instruments, and they will become suddenly uh, the almighty. I never liked the concept of super Bernanke, super Greenspan, super Mario. That's not super. You are running, you are running a central bank. You have a mandate and you deliver it in the best way that you can do. And once you say super, it means let, us, let the fiscal authority go astray, I will take care of it, because I'm a responsible citizen. That's not the way to do governance. Governance has the vision of labor. Any one of you who runs a corporation knows that there are departments. And of course, at the end of the day, everyone pitches in to compensate for other weaknesses, but let's not codify it by saying, that's my new roles. I think that the danger is overburdening monetary policy, not underburdening. Jan, do you agree with that? Do you think there is a risk, uh, and is next year going to be the beginning, perhaps, of this environment that we have entrusted, or we've expected too much of central banks? That, we, that they really are, they have been the only institution that's really done very much, um, and we're relying on them to a degree that, that can't be fulfilled. And, as part of that. I mean, I'm, I hear what, what Jacob said, but I'm thinking, yes, price stability is the goal, but actually, you know, we are, inflation is below target, and, and deflation is, in fact, a risk, okay. in, certainly in Europe. And so where do you see central bankers' main uh, challenges next year, and, and do you share this concern that they're being expected to do too much? I mean, I, sh I share the broad concern. Uh, I still think that uh, even, even next year, and even in a somewhat better growth environment uh, in the US, and maybe even a slightly better growth environment in Europe, and you'll, you'll, you'll get to that, even in that kind of world, uh, the risks are still mostly on the side of missing the employment mandate on the weak side and the inflation mandate on the, on the weak side. Uh, so I think that even in a world in which you know, we grow at a 3% pace, 
uh, and the unemployment rate uh, falls to, uh, you know, down to six and a half percent, and you know, maybe below. Uh, even in that sort of world, I think there will still be uh, need for monetary support uh, to 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 the to the economy. I mean, I do think there will, will probably be some tapering uh, of QE. Uh, I think it's become relatively clear that the Fed's uh, view of how powerful quantitative easing is for boosting growth, uh, that they've, they've taken that down a little bit. And, and Bernanke's recent speech, uh, I think, make, made that clear. Uh, but I think they're going to err on the side of tapering later uh, and also shoring up the forward guidance for the funds rate in a way uh, that ensures, or tries to ensure at least, that we don't get a rerun of what, uh, what happened over the summer. Uh, when they basically lost control over short-term interest rate expectations, and that really was uh, the way in which this uh, this whole taper tantrum uh, turned into uh, such a such such a damaging uh, event from a, from a markets and economy. So you think once again they will they will act later and more modestly than people now expect? Yes, I mean on the tapering, I don't think I'm too far away from uh, from the consensus uh, in terms of. Uh, you know, March versus maybe maybe other people are in January. Maybe there are some some people in uh, in December. Uh, but I think as far as the path for the funds rate goes, uh, I think it's going to take a long time before they hike for the first time. We're in early 2016, and that's definitely towards the later end. Just um, very briefly before we move on to the next topic, do you think when the history books are written, both of you, people will say central bankers in 20? 14, 20, well, even before 2014, did too much or did they do too little? Very too, briefly. Too little. Too little. I think that we should shift the direction we're expected to do too much rather than do too much. The central banks, basically, the train has left the station. At the present time, the comp this extension of the balance sheets have been dramatic. You know, if in June, 2007, you define it as 100, the size of the balance sheet, today the Fed is 450 in such a short period of time. That's an expansion which is very, very large. If you look at the composition, we already spoke about it. Now, the fact that Briefly, it is Daniel, not... I want to move on to the next topic. Yes, so where did it all go? Well, there has been a collapse of velocity. Do we believe that velocity will stay low for so long? Where did it go if it did not go to the consumer price index, maybe it went to the asset price index. We need to understand it a little bit uh, better. And also, my final remark, since we are sitting in America, uh, the concept of the dual mandate, where the Fed is uh, having both price stability and output and growth and motherhood and apple pie, that's an American concept which is part of the law. But most central banks in the world do not have this kind of a fuzzy wide range. They have financial stability, price stability, period. And ask Volcker if he has ever mentioned the word dual mandate. He was never mentioning it. Is it because un unemployment was not important? It was. But he believed that the best way to secure growth is by delivering on price stability. Thank you. You know what, that, that, I want to move on to the rest of the world. That discussion and this difference of opinion epitomizes, I think, what will be one of the big policy debates going forward. Have central banks done, and are they doing too little? Do we need a lot more? Or have they gone beyond where they ought to have gone? Just, and I want to leave time for questions. One more big area I'd like to cover, which is the rest of the world, particularly the emerging world. We focused a lot on the US. The hope for over the past few years has always been that the weakness in the rich world would be made up for by rising emerging economies. And the, the center of gravity of the world economy would shift and the growth would come from there. In the last couple of years, as, as, as we all know, growth has been very disappointing, slowed sharply in big emerging economies. So is it time to look at these economies with less rose-tinted spectacles, or is the sort of place to be optimistic about the world economy still the emerging world? Yeah. I mean, structurally, from a very long-term perspective, I think there's still a lot to like in the emerging world. Uh, long-term growth trends in the emerging world are going to continue to be much higher than, uh, than in the advanced economies for yeah, for all of the reasons that everybody in the room will be aware of, basically convergence uh, and the opportunity for growing faster if you're starting from a, from a lower level. Having said that, I think in the near term, it's going to be a somewhat tougher environment. Uh, in, the, in the advanced economies, you know, we fell into a very deep hole 
and we're crawling out of that hole and there's still, there's still uh, quite a lot of crawling to do and maybe we'll be crawling a little more quickly next year. Uh, but it's pretty clear that if we, if we get the wind at our back a little bit in terms of uh, uh, you know, less drag from private sector uh, deleveraging, uh, less drag from the fiscal side, uh, maybe you know, some escape velocity gradually developing, that that can actually go on for, uh, for quite a long time before you really run into uh, inflationary, um, uh, inflationary problems. I think in the, in the emerging world, it's much more finely balanced. Uh, growth has been pretty weak in most of them, uh, but nevertheless, inflation is actually quite high. Output's pretty close to potential in, uh, in a lot of them. Uh, you know, you take, uh, take places like Brazil or, or, or India, uh, but, but of course there are many more examples where uh, you, 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 are, you probably are somewhere close to potential and that's why uh, both inflation and growth uh, are potentially an issue. And if you're a policymaker, uh, you need to be very nimble uh, in terms of uh, you know, shifting from, from, from focusing on one side uh, of, of, the, of the issue to, uh, to, to the other side. And that's, uh, that's potentially, uh, uh, potentially difficult for policymakers and for markets as well. So they're going to better long-term potential, but still tough, tough next year in the I think in the still term. tougher going for a while. Jacob, what's your view? Well, first the facts. Uh, the center of gravity of the world has shifted from the industrial world to the emerging world. In 1990, if you only look at the three blocks, US, Europe, and Japan, you knew where the world goes. 65%, two thirds of world output was produced in that part. Fast forward last, this year, US, Japan, and Europe together produce only 45% of world output. It's a huge change. Where did it all go? In 1990, India and China together produced 7% of world output. Today, more than 20% of world output. So the structure has changed. And it's going to change. Why? Because the major robust forecast comes from demography. In the coming 20 years, the world population will be larger than what it is now by about one and a half billion people. Where will they all be? More than 1.4 of the one and a half will be in the emerging markets. All the rest in the industrial economies that are aging, and some of them are shrinking. In Japan, all the cohorts will have less members in them unless you are in the cohort of 80 plus. If you want to see more friends, you better be 80 and above. <laughs> China is aging, even though the population is growing. India, by the same token, has a very beautiful Gaussian distribution, and it will surpass uh, many others, notwithstanding the, the, the slower growth recently. And of course, Africa is a big challenge. You know, based on birth, third of the additional population of the world will be in Africa if they survive many other health challenges. So that's why this is a fact that will be there. And all other forecasts are around the margins of this big, big, heavy tanker that moves forward. And the challenge is to turn that into an opportunity, particularly of in somewhere course. like Africa. I want to open the floor now to questions, because I've just noticed the time. Please just put your hand up, and we have roving mics to answer. Yes, lady here. Why don't you start without the mic, since the mic it hasn't is. got to you yet? Oh, it's it just is. coming, it's actually, it's right behind you. Oh. Thank you. Uh, good news causes the markets to fall. Doesn't that indicate to you a crazy distortion that, sh that should undermine your confidence? I think that's for Jan. I think, uh, yeah, <laughs> I think <laughs> if, that, uh, if that, happens on a consistent basis, then, uh, then yes, I think you, uh, uh, that, 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 that would be concerning because it would basically be a signal that uh, you are you know, closer to capacity constraints uh, than, than, what I've, uh, than, than what I've been saying. I mean, that's the, the sort of prime environment uh, in which you would expect stronger growth, stronger growth news to lead to worse market outcomes because the markets would be saying, uh, you can't actually go, grow more quickly because uh, it's all structural and you've, uh, you've sort of run out of the, the room to grow. 
but I, I don't think that is ultimately the world uh, we live in. And so ultimately, I also don't think that uh, better news is going to uh, translate into, into worse, worse no, market could, outcomes. Couldn't it also be that good news means, aha, the Fed is going to do more faster, and since asset prices are being propped up by the Fed, then the market goes down? Uh, the, the Fed's going to, going, to going to taper more quickly, right. No, I mean, I think, I think there, there is some of that, but I think on a consistent basis, I think good news will translate into broadly good news as far as the asset markets are concerned as well. Uh, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, at 8.30 on a, uh, on a Friday, uh, in the first week of the month, that if you get a stronger than expected payroll number, uh, that therefore uh, you're going to always have an increase in stock prices. Uh, uh, but, uh, but I do think that uh, longer term good news is good news. I'm glad good news remains to be good news. Here, gentlemen here. Uh, my question is, given the spending in health care in the U.S. is such a big part of our economy, and the debacle of uh, Obamacare. How does that enter into your thoughts about how this economy grows next year? I mean, I think that uh, from a cyclical perspective, uh, it's, un it's unclear whether uh, healthcare is going to be a major mover. Uh, it's, I, don't, I don't think uh, uh, we really know yet, uh, you know, how the how the whole healthcare thing is is ultimately going to come out. You know, obviously the rollout has been uh, very very problematic. Uh, what we don't know yet is, uh, you know, where the the uh, reforms are going to stand, uh, say six months uh, six months down the road. We haven't seen a, a major impact, uh, I think, on uh, any of the macroeconomic variables. Um, yeah, consumer confidence is a little lower than it was in the summer. Uh, on the other hand, it has recovered uh, from the dip that it took uh, just after the, uh, the government shutdown. Uh, so I wouldn't really expect, um, at this point, I wouldn't expect to see a major macroeconomic fallout uh, from what's going on in the healthcare sector. You're absolutely right that from a longer term perspective, uh, healthcare is you know, one of the, if not the sort of key domestic policy challenge. Uh, if you look at the longer term uh, budget projections, uh, the vast majority of the projected deterioration, you know, 20, 30, 40 years down the road, uh, comes from the sharp increases in federally financed health care costs. So it's a, it's a very, very important issue. But for the cycle, I'm not so sure. Let's have another question. And let's have another question. Great. One, one more question. Yes, gentleman there, halfway back. Yes, right there. I was wondering your thoughts on Japan and specifically on Abenomics and whether Abe will have the courage and the ability to push through at least two of his three pillars, and if so or if not, what will be the effects on the Japanese economy and the follow-on effects on the world economy? Let's start. Jacob, you, you, you've, you've seen big policy shifts in your time. How, how do you view Abenomics? Well, let's start how it is viewed in, in Japan, because that's a very important element, because one of the things that created the lost decade or even lost decades in Japan has been the implosion of uh, optimism and everything of that type. And it is in this regard that Abenomics is viewed as the thing that was needed to shake the tree. So they are very, very pleased if you talk to the various sectors. They are happy to see the tree being shaken. The question is, are we going to deliver on all of those things? The central bank under Kuroda-san he is, of course, doing very strongly, and the issue is the other reforms. I think the jury is still out, but uh, uh, it's a very dramatic... Comp if you talked about the U.S. being in an uncharted territory, so is Japan. So uh, we are holding our breath while, while they are losing some uh, oxygen. So we'll see what happens. I wish I could ask for more questions, but I've just seen that, that we're running out of time. I, I want to end with, and I mean this to be brief, two very brief, uh, leave the audience with something that is going to happen in 2014 or a little beyond that they may not have thought about but should be thinking about. Jacob, I'm going to start with you, but briefly. Okay, the list is long, <laughs> but, uh, <coughs> but I will use the constraint of the chairperson by picking up on the question that you raised. Uh, 
Jan already alluded to the fact that if you look at the budget, the fastest growing component is on healthcare. But you must recognize the orders of magnitude. Today, healthcare in the budget, if you take the US budget, remove interest payments so as to look at everything else but interest payments, 25% of the budget goes on healthcare. And about a quarter goes on social security leaving about 50% for everything else, defense, education, infrastructure, etc. Fast forward, under the current trajectory, only the effect of aging and things of that type, the proportion of the very same budget going on healthcare will be close to 40%. Social security, again, about a quarter, leaving therefore just 38% of total government spending other than interest payment to cover education, infrastructure, defense, and you name it. That circle cannot be squared. Basically what we are told here by this number is that if you continue on this trajectory, there will be needed a rewriting of the social contract. Either citizens will be willing to accept less services from the government or willing to pay more for the services they obtain. The current train does not lead us anywhere. And the reason why, while you ask about 2014, I answer about 2035, is that unless we, in 2014 we recognize where the train goes, we will hit the wall. So that's what uh, I think that the debate should be really on the longer term. What does it mean about the contract between governments and its citizens? Is the entitlements indeed entitlements? And notice I did not mention the Fed, and properly so. Uh, the issues are structural, the issues are not monetary or financial. Thank you. Jan, the last word is yours. So our forecast is above consensus on, uh, on growth, below consensus on inflation, and uh, more dovish than consensus on the, on the Fed. I think as we go into 2014, uh, you know, as markets look at this, assuming it's correct, of course, uh, as markets look at, the, at this, they are going to be more doubtful that all of these things really can be squared. And you know, maybe you will get uh, some more uh, instances in which good news is treated as bad news because markets don't like these types of output gap stories where you can grow a little faster for a while, uh, but it doesn't really translate into inflation uh, and, uh, and higher interest rates. Uh, I think uh, the surprise in all of 2014 uh, if we're right, is that these things can be squared and you can have a period during which growth is better uh, and inflation and rising interest rates uh, and tighter monetary policy are still not, uh, not, not a major concern. Well, that would be a welcome outcome. If you're, uh, if you're right, we'll invite you back next year to, uh, to discuss. <laughs> the pressure is on. <laughs> if you're wrong, <laughs> that's it. Pressure is always on. Thank you both very much indeed. Jacob, thank you. Thank you. Jan, thank, thank you. you.